Hey, what's poppin'? It's King Lil G. Shout out to Split DTV, man. We represented from LA all the way to Florida. We out. Hey. Just happened to be one of the bigger ones, and you know, a lot of shit was 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 going on growing up. Um, you know, I just I just kind of like try to guide, glide around all the all the bullshit and just basically stay out the of harm's way because it was it was it was lurking. It was running around looking for us. You yeah. know what I mean? And I kept my you know my my composure. I kept and and you know jail had a lot to do with me staying alive. I yeah. Did, you know me being in the system so much kept me off the streets and not in, in harm's way. Even though in there, you know, shit could happen too, man. Shit, a lot of shit happens in there as well. But at the same time, out here, it was like a whole different world, man. Like, you know, it's, and, and I feel like growing up over here was a blessing and a curse, you know, at the same time. The blessing because I love my homies. You know, I love my family, my people from over here. And the curse is because, of course, the, you know, the cops gave us a hard time right. for being from here and being, you know, having the last name I have because of my dad. And, you know, they dealt with him for years and years and years as well. So they just having that last name, me and my little brother, and then we, we had a rough time because of that. You know what I'm saying? Right. It's like it was, it, it wouldn't end. It, would, it wouldn't end. It was rough. Yeah. You know something? Let me. I want to speak on that, man. Because well, well, going back to your old interview, right? I, you gave me the vibe that you was you was born in, not sworn in. Right. And that and and that that's what's funny about it is that I believe if I really wanted to just be part of it, I could have without having to go through the whole getting jumped in because I had so much love. You know what I'm saying? My my boys were already from there. Like I didn't. It wasn't necessary that I said, hey. I'm gonna just join this shit. I, I, that was my decision. That was my choice. And like I said, we, you know, we were born right here on this block where my homies is where we at. You know what I mean? Like it's, it was more of a, a choice. I bet I, I gotta say, like it was my choice to just join and get jumped in the right way, the proper way, and you know, really be part of it. Like I, I look, like I said, I look at it as a family, yeah, not as a gang. Yeah, you know what I'm saying because it's not. We don't wake up every day saying we about to go out there and do bad shit. You know what I mean? Like at the end of the day, there's positives, things that are going on in this neighborhood. People, you know, doing, you know, stuff for the kids and stuff like that. Like it's it's definitely not always negative. And you know, I'm proud to say that I'm part of this neighborhood. You know what I mean? I'm I'm, I'm proud to be part of Florence. Like I'm, I'm everything we do is is for the better now. Like a lot of a lot of a lot of positive things happening in this year, last year, like a lot of positive stuff. And I'm, I'm you know, blessed, blessed. And everything that I do myself is for my family and for my friends and my people that I grew up with. Man, I want to see everybody come up and succeed one way or the other. You know something, I want to say something for the people that's watching this. Right. And when Bob Dossie touched on it, Florence is a community, not a game. Right. You know what I'm saying? Y'all need to really listen to what he's saying. It's a community, not a gang, man. Now, um, you kind of opened up the door a little bit. Mm. You don't got to speak on it if you don't right, want right. to. Uh, you, you, you was talking about that a lot of good things happened right. last year. Can you uh, point out one, one of those things? Um, I mean, there's, you know, I won't mention certain, certain, uh, certain gangs or whatnot, but I will tell you there's a, there's a lot more peace going on between places that would not see eye to eye for for the life of me bro there's there's a lot more positivity in that and i feel a lot of life's being saved because of that you know what i mean yeah it's, a lot of people are, are alive right now because of that and it's and it's a blessing to, to to see that you know to see my people be able to communicate with other gangs that we we had no love for no likes no nothing it was just it was just all pure hate you know what I mean? And now I feel like we're, we're, we're progressing and being the bigger man and looking at the situation like, okay, hey, we're all men. Like, why continue this? You know what I mean? Let's make something better for the kids that are growing up and going to school. And the kids that are, are you know, that, that's the future. The kids are the future. So why do we want this to continue and see our kids die? For 
other gangs that are looking at y'all as, right. as, as leaders and pioneers and just trying to see like like how like how the fuck do you pull that off you know right. what i'm saying that might want to right because like it, it definitely was trailblazing that part no for sure it's i mean it's it's definitely something big and you know it's just it just happened bro i mean i can't sit here and explain how or yeah. who or what it's just it's something that, that that happened and it's something that like i said i'm i'm blessed to, to be able to see with my own eyes and and acknowledge and, and appreciate it because it's not something that happens every day from people like you know what i mean like yeah of our nature from from our hood like it's not something that just happens you know what i mean and, and it did it's like you wake up and there's snow in, in Los Angeles. Like you're tripping <laughs> out, man. What the hell, snowing? <laughs> that's you exactly know, what all happened. All you can do is appreciate it, bro. Like yeah. that's it. You know what I mean? And like I said, that's it's a beautiful thing, man. It is. It is. It, it, and it, it it definitely shocked. It it shocked a lot of people. It's shocking. I was right. shocked. Right. It left a lot of people in the maze and, yeah. and and just like he said, wondering how did this come about? You know what I'm saying? And it's like I said, I I don't even know. But at the end of the day, I'm I'm for it, and uh, like I'm I'm happy that it that it's you know it's peace now because I mean I want my son to be able to walk to the store. I want my little nephew to be able to walk to the store and get back with whatever he brought from the store, and not end up on a corner dead or arrested or because of everything that's going on. You know what I mean? So it's it's, it's definitely a positive a positive move and and a, and, a, and a blessing to be part of of everything that's going on here. Now. Um I want to. I, I just had some thoughts, man. Right. I wonder how did the law enforcement mm. feel about that? Cause I, you you'll think that they'll be excited about right. about about a peace treaty between two different neighborhoods. Right. No, that that would be the first thing you would think is that people would be. I, I'm sure that not all of them feel the same way. I'm sure that they have mixed emotions and mixed feelings about what took place. I'm sure some of them are happy to see that. That's that's something that, like I said, it doesn't happen every day. And at the end of the day, it's it's kind of less worrying for them. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because they don't got to be out here worried about this or that. Or, or, you know, and then there's some that will probably look at it like, oh, that's less work for us now. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I, I think they, they probably got different views and different emotions on towards that. You know what I mean? For the ones that are happy and proud about it, man, I respect that. And, you know, it's appreciated. Yeah. And for the ones that don't, it's like that's, that's your choice and your way of seeing you know how it is like it's it, and that's that's totally fine with us like at the end of the day it's like it's a positive thing and it's either going to be respected or not you know what i mean and at the end of the day i respect it i i think it's definitely a, a higher a higher move to to make like it's definitely a good positive thing you know yeah right now i, I want to talk I, you kind of shocked me on on, on on one of the interviews man right how did like how did the relationship between you and David Kenner even start? So with David Kenner, he uh, so I had a friend while I was incarcerated that. David but but before was, you start, tell people who David Kenner is. Right, David Kenner's a he's a high profile attorney. He was a uh, you know Suge Knight's attorney, Easy E, Tupac, like a lot of them back from those days. He was their attorney and he was part of the whole Death Row Records owner, part owner of the Death Row Records, I believe, with Harry O and everything that they had going so um i was incarcerated and i used to rap while i was incarcerated i've all like i said i've taken my rap with me everywhere that i go and um uh, i used to have people crowding around me while i'll be rapping i'm talking about blacks mexicans whites indians whatever you call it they were there they wanted to listen i had people pop out guitars and play guitars while i'll be rapping because they just wanted to be in that circle I had the COs come back there and be like, hey, bro, like, you guys can't all be back here like this. There'd be 30 of us hanging out in a little hallway where it's only supposed to be two people walking through there at a time, you know what I mean? But I got the whole hallway packed with people wanting to listen to what I had to say. And so from that point, there was a there was a homie there that, that, that um, he was from Israel, he was an Israeli dude. Uh, he, uh, he took a real good liking to me, man. Like, we would chop it up, and he liked the way I rapped, and he told me, hey, you know, how would you like... If I had David Kenner pull you out and chop it up with you, and at the moment I didn't really know who David Kenner was. Okay. I knew the name, but it was it wasn't nothing like That's big David to Kenner. me. That was yeah. just David Kenner, right? So they pulled me out for a visit, and uh, I sat down, and one of the lady COs that was right there was like, uh, 
you got an attorney visit? And I was like, yeah, I'm waiting for the attorney. She was like, I guess because they on the paperwork, it tells you who the attorney is. And she seen it and was like, David Kenner's your attorney? And I'm like, yeah. She was like, what the fuck? And she tripped out. And I was like, <laughs> I tripped out. I was like, why is she tripping, you know? And the other lady that was there asked her, like, who's David Kenner? She's like, that's a million dollar attorney right there. Like, that's the man. Like, you know what I mean? And then he came in. There was this other dude getting that had an attorney visit in an attorney room. And David Kenner kicked him out. He went in there and was like, hey, we need this room. Boom. They kicked him out and me and him went in there. Me, him, and his two, um, like, his secretary or whatever and his son, whatever, whoever people he had with him. Uh, so I went in there. He tells me, hey, so, you know, this guy that saw my case load told me, you know, you do music really good. And I told him, well, I'll try. He's like, well, let me see. Let me hear something. So I spit something for him. And I had David Kenner's secretary, which is a white lady, and his other partner there was a white man. His name was Brett. They were both bobbing their heads to my music, and I was like tripping out because I'm like, man, I got the white man right here. Shit, his head to this shit. Like, I, I couldn't believe it, bro. Like it was something that was amazing to me. So he told me, rap another song. I want to see them give you the same expression that they just did to this last one. I'm like, all right. So I spit another one, and he was like, bro, what are you doing in jail? And I was like, my time. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm paying for my crimes, bro. That's what I'm in here for. And he said, look, if I was to be able to get you on a on a bail, get you out, get you to work with Dr. Dre, 50 Cent, Eminem, he's like, would you be willing to go do that and then come back and do your time? And I'm like, hell yeah. Like, I got to do my time anyways. Yeah. So it's like, that's a plus. If I go do that, I got, I got something to look forward to when I come home. Yeah. So he's like, okay, I'm going to work on that. So he left. But my timing was already getting short. We had already been there for almost three years, waiting, fighting our case. My time was basically getting shortened up. I had to take my, my, my deal already or else she was gonna be out, out the window. Yeah. So we waited and waited as long as we could and I postponed it so many times. Cause that's the place I told you that I kinda got comfortable and didn't wanna leave once it was time to leave. Yeah. Um, finally, I ended up getting sentenced. I had to call David Kenner and tell him, hey look, there's not gonna be no more bail, so don't even try it no more. Like, I'm, I'm already sentenced, I have to go do my time. He's like, look man, get to where you're going, call me every six months. You know, make sure, just tap in with me. When you get home, we'll figure something out. I got there, bro, I called him every day. I was like, <laughs> I, I called him every single day. Yeah. I didn't waste my phone time on no freaking females, I didn't waste my phone time on nobody, but David Kent. Yeah. Because I was like, this is my future right here. I need, he's going to be the one to help me kick this door in. You know what I mean? I already knew what I had. I knew what I had to do. I just needed the right tools. Yeah. So I stayed in touch with David Kenner to where it got to the point where David Kenner would tell people, he's like my son. <laughs> I talk to him daily. Baldy. He called me Baldy. Yeah. That's his name. For, for me, it's Baldy. That's all. He don't call me Baldachi. He don't call me Face LA. He called me Baldy. So everybody, oh, yeah, I know Baldy. That's my, that's my son right there. That's like my son. So. I stayed in touch with him, like I said, daily. And then uh, when it was time to come home, I let him know, like, hey, I'm, I'm almost home. He's like, well, get out here and let's let's get to work. So I came home and, you know, I, I we tried. David Kenner has a lot of other stuff going on, his his uh, career and his, his law and all that, which, yeah. of course, that comes first, you know what I mean, before anything. And it's a process, you know, everything with the music, to me, it's a really big process. It's not overnight. I don't give a shit who you know. You still got ropes you gotta climb and you got gates you gotta jump before you get to to wherever you're trying to get to. Like it's not gonna be you snap your fingers and you got it. Yeah. You know what I mean? So at the end of the day, it's like I didn't fall out with David Kenner, but I basically started doing my own shit and just allowing him to continue doing his law thing and I just you know, he was really, really busy. Okay. And I was really, really busy. Gotcha. So two schedules like that, they just don't really you can't put them together, you know what I mean? At the end of the day, he's stu you know, stuck doing his law and I'm stuck doing music, so. I can't say that his resources got me really too much further to where I'm at now. I kinda, I kinda broke that down by myself, bro. Like, not my, myself personally, but of course with my team and with my boys that I work with, you know, my boys that I started with, Smooth Hustle, you know, to where I'm at now with the effort. Like, it, it was all of us. You know what I mean? We basically tore down these doors together. You know, whether or not some people are doing some certain things in life, I continue with the music, and it's definitely getting us to where we need to get at. What year, what year would you say that you actually made, like you made a decision, hey, I'm gonna take this music serious? Um, 
I want to say maybe 2000. So I came home in 2005 from State Penn. Okay. And I started doing music, but like I said, it was street shit. It was recording on in in homies' garages type shit. I, I didn't know what a real studio felt like to record in. Um, then I got a little taste of it right before I went to the feds when my boys were smooth hustle. You know, they took me to a real recording studio and <clears throat> kind of gave me the ropes on how to record, how to do my ad libs and do my oohs and ahs and do, do you know, which I'm thankful for because I use it till this day. The same pattern, the same method, I use it till this day. And now it just feels like I kind of just got so comfortable in the booth that it's like a piece of cake now. I go in the studios and I surprise the engineer, the artists that I'm working with, whoever's in the place, they're surprised because they don't expect what I talk about, how I talk about it, and how quick I get it done. Yeah. You know? So I feel like when I started really, really taking this serious was when I came home in 2011. I, I, I haven't stopped running since then. You know, I just been I just been going. Dude, dude, so, so 2011, all right, so two years, two years later, your dad passed, passes away. Right. All right, um, how did, how did, it, how did that affect you mentally, bro? That was a, that was a strong one, man. That was a strong point in my life, because, you know, my, like I said, my dad was, was everything, basically, to me, like, you know, and it was, that definitely was more than just a bump in the road. That, that was almost an immediate stop for me. Okay. I was seconds away from just saying, fuck it, I ain't doing this shit no more. Fuck this music, let me get back to the street, let me get back to my hustling, let me get back to my gang banging, you know what I mean? Like I wanted I, I I was I was in a in a bubble. I was in the music, so I had one foot in and one foot out. I had to make a choice. Okay. And I felt like the choice that I've been making my whole life, which is the dope dealing, the gang banging hasn't really gotten me anywhere. You know, at the end of the day, it's like, yes, it got me, you know, a lot of love, a lot of respect, a lot of all that, you know what I'm saying? But at the end of the day, as far as something to leave my kids, that's not the choice that I needed to make. I needed to make a choice that I'm gonna be able to create something for my children, for my family that's gonna be here after myself. Okay. So the music <clears throat> was definitely an option because I was good at it and because I was already knee deep into it where it was like I had to I had to keep running with this you know what I mean there's no turning back there's no giving up there's no stopping here and my dad would have been proud for me to make that decision so that's the main reason I made that decision because my dad I know he's looking down right now with a smile on his face you know yes sir looking down or looking up wherever side he's at he's, he's looking <laughs> you know what I mean my pops is looking you know what I'm saying my yeah. pops was a crazy motherfucker man went so, straight to the studio after right you. yeah I went I went directly to the studio when my pops passed away the second he died I called my boy Peterbilt uh -huh. JR I called him on the phone I said hey check it out bro we need to go make a song he got up we went straight to the studio and went to Parks Moon Hustle Studio and recorded a track. He made a song for your daddy, made correct? Made a song for my dad. And that's is, that on, is, is that on a Badachi Code? No, that's on um, YouTube, right? But it's not on um, oh, it's it's like like the album. Yeah, okay. I dropped it as a single. The video. Okay. Yeah. Um, kind of violation for that video. I actually did catch a violation for the video. How? Because I was on an ankle monitor when all that was going on. They had me on an ankle bracelet and I went to go record the video. I told them that I was buying some flowers for one of my aunts that was sick or yeah. something. And we went to the cemetery and recorded a video. But dude that shot the video forgot to edit the part where my ankle monitor was on it. Oh. They caught it and they violated me for that shit. Wow, that's I went crazy. Back, we went back and did a couple months, which was, which, like I said, man, every time I go to jail, I look at it as it's either a blessing, you know what I mean? And most likely it's a blessing for me not to get caught up in something worse out here or shot up or being at the wrong place at the wrong time and getting myself, right. you know, in a, in a deeper mess. Violation wasn't shit. I was like, let's go do this. Yeah. You know? I'll do this on the toilet. But <laughs> you said something real deep though, brother. Because you know, uh, uh, a lot of people, if they lose some, uh, especially a, a parent that, that they was really close to, right. a lot of people turn to drugs, or so a lot of people turn to their vices right. to, to cope. Right. But you turn to music. Yeah. And I feel like I already smoke weed, so it's like weed co makes me cope with, with everything, you know what I'm saying? And yeah. At the end of the day, I look at it like, any further, any other drug that I use was only gonna take me the opposite way that I'm trying to go. Yeah. 
You know what I mean? It's gonna take me back to everything else I do and everywhere, you know what I mean? What I'm used to. And I didn't want that no more. I wanted, you know, positivity. I wanted something to be able to make my family and my friends proud.